Now let's get some answers about that North Coast quake that measures 7.0 and the tsunami warning that followed that affected us. Joining us live now is Dr. Lucy Jones, founder and chief scientist at the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society. Dr. Jones, thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Um, really a pleasure to have you. By the way, I follow you on Blue Sky. Just wanted you to know that. Um, Thank you. All right, so how large is this magnitude 7.0? Because I've lived in the Bay Area a long time. I think the biggest I experienced was the 6.9 in Loma Prieta. So historically and scientifically, talk about a 7.0. All right, it's not that different from Loma Prieta, 6.9, it's relatively close. What's different is this is offshore, whereas of course Loma Prieta was right underneath people up there in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And we forget that, I mean, that magnitude says the total energy released by the earthquake. The energy that gets to you and what you perceive depends very strongly on how far away you are from the source of, of that energy. And the fact that this was offshore just means that there's, you know, you'll have lots of things thrown off of shelves at the sort of intensity seven, intensity eight that you'd expect from this at 70 kilometers distance. But you're not seeing the upside down grand pianos that we saw in Loma Prieta because there's no pia no pianos out in the middle of the ocean. Right. I mean, distance aside, does it make a difference whether it's centered in the ocean or under the ground on land? No, I mean, the, under the ocean is land, right? Oh, it's good point. the seafloor, yeah. right? Yeah. So the earthquakes in the crust, what's different is just because there's no people nearby. It's all about how far away you are from the source of that energy. Same reason that a really deep earthquake doesn't do as much damage because everybody is, is you know, some distance away just because it has to get all the way to the Earth's surface. Okay, by the way, we're showing some of the damage we're seeing really in the immediate area near Ferndale, right. uh, Eureka, around there. So it seems to be in line with the 7.0. But talk about the aftershocks. I think we count how many now, 75 and over, is that normal? Oh, it's a, it's a pretty normal, if anything, it's a little on the, the low side for magnitude seven. I think it's, it's pretty average. Um, I haven't seen anything above five, and on average, you'd expect the biggest aftershock to be about five and a half, but we have a big variation within that. I mean, 5% of the time, the aftershocks get bigger than the main shock, right? And we, the first one becomes a foreshock, and you know, 5% of the time, the largest aftershock is several units of magnitude smaller. So this is in that normal range. Could we still expect something bigger now that we're four hours past the quake? It's always possible. Right? It's not that you expect it. The, uh, as I said, it's about 5% of the time, and the t it dies off with time so that uh, one quarter of the risk is in the first hour. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to six hours out, half of the risk is gone. By the time you get to 24 hours, most of the risk is gone. So it, and you still see the long tail, um, but uh, the die-off is really rapid, but we're not so far away that it's gone. Okay, but what's more expected is like a bunch of threes, fours, maybe even a five in the next days or two. Yeah, and even a six. Okay. I mean, a six offshore really isn't gonna be doing much of any extra damage. It'll just be too far away. Okay, for us, there was a tsunami warning for about an hour. Right. Uh, why was that feared, and then why did it not materialize? Um, I why it didn't materialize is I we, we didn't move enough water, uh, right? So a tsunami happens because an earthquake changes the shape of the seafloor. And if the earthquake pushes the ground up and over the other side, then the water that used to be there has to go somewhere else, and that's the tsunami wave. In this earthquake, the ground moves sideways. It was a strike-slip earthquake, and that means that we didn't really change the shape of the seafloor much. So once we saw the... the what's called the focal mechanism, showing us it was a strikes the earthquake. We recognize that the chances of it having a damaging tsunami is, is very, very low. And even, even if it had been a thrust fault, a 7.0 isn't a very big fault. And the big tsunamis happen because you move a huge amount of water. NOAA's principle is that they warn at seven and a half, and there's a couple of places like this one where they warn at seven. Why, why this is considered quite so dangerous, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But once they put out a warning, they will not cancel it until they've been able to confirm mm. that there's no water, you know, no wave showing up on any of their buoys. So you have that hour where people are dealing with the warning and before they come and say, okay, actually it wasn't, it wasn't big enough to do it. But this is one of those ones that was just barely at the margin that they would have called an alert and clearly they decided to. Okay. Uh, look, and here's where we get to the holy grail part of the question, which is 
will we ever be able to predict earthquakes? I mean, are there breakthroughs on the horizon that you can see? I don't think we will ever predict earthquakes. I think that, for one thing, you don't want me to predict all earthquakes. You want us to predict the very few of them that are going to be large, which means you want us to predict the magnitude of a future earthquake. But the magnitude is determined by how long a piece of fault moves in an event. So you're needing to predict not just when it's starting, but how it's stopping, whether it runs into something on the fault that keeps it short or whether it keeps on going and ruptures into a big earthquake. And right now, as far as we can tell, we don't see any evidence that how they stop is connected to how they start. And if that's true, we'll never have predictions. Oh, okay. That's kind of not what I want. But we have early warning. (laughs) Okay. Right? We'll tell you the earthquake's underway and hopefully get the message to you before the shaking does. Right. Um, And the consolation prize, think about it. Would you rather have two hours to get out of a bad building or a building that doesn't fall down in the first place? Ah. And I think we could see that what we really need with earthquakes is, yeah. how to, is the ladder, is mm-hmm. how to build right so that we can have a really big earthquake and go on through. Before I let you go, real quickly, because I've been wondering about this for a while now, which is, does climate change affect seismic activity at all? No, because the earthquake's happening deep in the earth and the uh, uh, the change in the, in the atmosphere changes the rate of, of storms and floods but it doesn't change earthquakes. Okay, well, at least there's that. Dr. Lucy Jones. At least that, (laughs) exactly. Uh, With the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.